is indeed. It's time to start. Okay. Um, if you are new to the science circle, or if you are, like I said, a veteran, uh, remember that our web page is here, and there's a lot on it. I'm going to be reminding you of that here in a minute. And yes, you are in the right place if uh, you wanted to come see the uh, moon base group. It's just that, like I mentioned, I was thinking about what we're actually doing, and it's a 15th celebration, 15th anniversary celebration of the uh, science circle. Um, is anyone in the audience, uh, were you around in Second Life um, 15 years ago, or uh, were you part of the science circle 15 years ago? Okay, so I think everyone knows uh, that's been a member, however long, has found this, uh, found this group uh, to be uh, a unique and extraordinary uh, organization. Uh, we're one of the only organizations of our, uh, well, one of the only organizations, but also of our kind, that have been continuously uh, operating for 15 years in, in Second Life. And if you weren't here, uh, we started as a uh, imagination of uh, Chantal as a philosophy forum back in um, 2007 when she envisioned a group that would talk about different uh, uh, philosophy subjects, much like uh, they did in ancient Greece. So therefore, you have got a, a Greek-looking building there. And then a year later, uh, there was a spinoff. I should notice how many people were scientists, and so she had a spinoff into a uh, science circle. Um, I was privileged to get the first presentation for the science circle back in March 4th, 2008, on a topic, yeah, primitive, well, they are primitive, uh, on a topic that is still relevant, that is how humans have uh, changed the earth as much as any natural forces. Well, why the science circle? I probably don't have to tell you that. Um, is all of these reasons. It's, um, and if you've been around Second Life, you'll probably agree. Uh, that every one of these uh, you found in, in Second Life. So we are not only in Second Life. We're a, a nonprofit organization, international, um, legal, everything. But we operate mostly in Second Life because, hey, there's no parallel to Second Life even 15 years later. Why the science circle? Well, the, uh, Chantal was interviewed back in 2013 and 2015. And you can see that what she said back then, uh, even 10 years ago, is as relevant then, relevant then as it is today. Uh, there's, there, she noticed, uh, there, and that's part of who we are as a science circle. We're both professionals, but also students. We um, have credentials, but, uh, but also just appreciate science. So we have science enthusiasts as well as vetted. Uh, professionals, as well as educators, as well as students. And that's just as relevant as today, even more relevant, uh, which makes us unique. In other words, just like the circle, that's where the science circle part came in, just like we uh, sat around in circles during the philosophy forum, anytime you see a circular table or a circle, there is no hierarchy there. In other words, everyone's opinion um, is as relevant as anyone else. I didn't say it's the truth, but it's <laughs> but it's as relevant. Okay, we're we're open to yeah, everyone counts, <laughs> and and we're open to uh, hearing different points of view. Okay, so in two thousand ten, in yeah, in two thousand ten, we started. Uh, there was a, several things that went on. One, if you remember, in that summer, uh, Second Life added voice. Uh, well, that's kind of interesting uh, because it was the first time that anyone had heard another's voice. It was also, we thought, uh, Chantel uh, decided it was time to have a board of directors to figure out like who we are and what we were there for and to plan and oversee events. There's been quite a change in the board of directors over time, um, but the idea is still the same. And in 2015, we became a legitimate um, 
international nonprofit. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. Well, I borrow, I borrow this from some of the other celebrations as well as added things to it. I know. Uh, but we, in 2016, excuse me, we became a legitimate um, nonprofit organization called the Science Circle Foundation. Okay, and for you guys that have not been to the web page recently, uh, we are who I mentioned we are, and then our mission basically is to enhance an understanding and learning across disciplines with a focus on science in a virtual environment on a global scale. And so let's take a look then at science circle activities which you'll agree are, are well or x as it's called now um yeah uh why which are widely diverse uh and some of the types of things we've done now i'm gonna here again I, this is not our our presentation is mostly on the moon thing so i'm going to kind of work through some of this okay but uh one of our missions then is to learn uh, with presentations and field trips. That's the explore part. Um, and you'll notice collaboration uh, among nations. And also in collaboration, we've done some professional research. This is just one of other papers. Uh, this is a uh, international uh, computer conference in Marrakesh, Morocco, that I did a paper with a um, woman from uh, Palestine, actually, she lived in Gaza Strip. And you, if you think about it, we probably would never have gotten together in first life, but second life makes that possible. And of course, we reached out, we've got lots of social media, which I'll take a look at here in a second. So in addition to second life, we've got a par some parallel regions, in fact, 15 of them and 98 available accounts in the open simulator. Uh, there's on the page, you might want to go back and check, there's science links and science news and uh, blogs on stargazing and blogs on uh, science and philosophy. We also are on uh, Flickr, YouTube, and LinkedIn, and three different languages in Facebook. We've also been, uh, speaking of reaching out, well, we are. Uh, in fact, actually, I, I'm sure I'm going to forget something in here because there's so much that we're involved in. And so one of the things we did over uh, several years was um, we were at the Virtual World's Best Practices in Education uh, starting in 2011. And those are a couple of the topics that we worked on as a group and presented. So in other words, so people would understand who we were and what we're doing. And so let's take a look then at the contributors. And so I had this, okay, first of all, if you look at the builds, there's three islands now, uh, Mike Shaw's chemistry world, uh, my uh, STEM island north of here, and then Science Circle Island itself. And if you look at the ground, there's both ground level builds as well as uh, builds above ground, and there is a... Uh, Teleport system, I almost forgot the word, a teleport system to get to them. So just take a look around if you haven't seen all those. And then there were lots and lots of different types of initiatives. Now, this is only in the last five years, but we got everything from the most recent maths club, which Robert Hendricks uh, started earlier this year, and then other ones over the different years. And we've got uh, Matt Burr's Bistro, and we've got Darwin Day and the concerts and uh, also, you'll notice that we decided to finally uh, try to work up something for both for everybody in the world. So we started in 2021 a, a East version of uh, the Science Circle, um, and lots and lots of other good stuff. Plus, the videos, uh, in other words, presentations like this are being uh, recorded and and things like that. Okay, so now I squished all this together because it actually ran into multiple pages, but in it, these are also other contributors. Now, I don't, if you, if you only presented in 2023, you're probably not up there. Uh, although some people presented many, many, many times, but 
that's uh, on the right is the people who've done presentations, field trips in the last five years. And then, yeah, and, well, thank you, actually. It takes a little while to put these uh, presentations together, a lot longer than an hour, in fact, a lot longer than a week. Uh, podcasts, science fairs, panels, all that stuff. Okay, and we have had other presentations. For example, this is an example of our 10th anniversary presentation. But um, we decided instead of having a party this time to do a project. Well, actually, yes. <laughs> Although Shanta knows a whole lot more than I do, and I probably don't want to know what she knows. So, but as far as the actual uh, oper operating side of it, um, I know uh, quite a bit because I've been around on it. Okay, so this year we decided to demonstrate what we can do instead of just celebrate what we have done. And so we decided, well, you know, back around the time of uh, Observe the Moon Night, which, by the way, I'm going to slip in here before the um, one coming up on the 21st of October this year. I'll be advertising that. But it's, but basically around that time we decided, wow, you know, uh, there's a lot going on with the moon, uh, particularly in, uh, lately. And what an interesting place to study science because it's, it's like nothing – well, it's like the science we have today, but it's a lot more challenging. So we, in other words, we have to adapt. What would the science and uh, other things have to do if we tried to build a moon base? It's one thing nobody's done. Okay, so early on in the moon base presentations, we basically said, okay, we've identified about eight different areas that have to do with the physical sciences, that have to do with the educational aspect, which remember that primarily we're a science education organization, and then had to do with human science, if you want to call it humanities, as well as outreach reach and writing, in other words, part of the outreach. Uh, we decided there was about eight of them, eight areas that we needed to explore if we were going to design and build a, and run our uh, moon base and then run our uh, simulated virtual moon base and then run our project. So um, communications, what we did is we first kind of had a steering committee, if you look on the upper left, and that's where we decided on the first parts of this. Now, lately, we've been working with teams uh, to coordinate and to meet there, and but we also early on decided to share what we we're doing, much like we're doing now. In fact, this is an upgrade to what we have been doing. So we had some presentations uh, back in March. Uh, you can see Natalie there because she was headed that or spearheaded that. We've got we shared with the East people. Uh, we tried to enlist people, which we did a good job of because uh, uh, a couple of people that are here now or going to talk now weren't part of that initial steering committee. And then we also have had almost every Monday since that probably March. Every Monday, we've had discussions at 10 a.m. Second Life Time on things we're doing. So let's take a look quick at the characteristics before we look at the teams themselves. But like we said, like I said, it's a demonstration of our strengths. Uh, there is, we both all have kind of a mutual interest in the science education, appreciation of virtual worlds. Uh, we have, we come at the project with a diverse of expertise and openness to others' perspectives. And then we also want to kind of, we also realize that the virtual world is an excellent place to interact, to make interactive builds and to collaborate in real time. And also, frankly, building here is a heck of a lot easier than building in a first life, and it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> and it can be scripted for both action and interactivity. And all that. So, you know, it, it, Second Life is still an unparalleled platform for all of that. So when we started developing, as I mentioned, first of all, we did something that is very different than anything I've done, which is essentially we didn't start out going, okay, this is we, what we want to do. Uh, this is, is it feasible or not? Okay, let's design it. Let's... Uh, develop it, let's test it, you know, all the types of things I'm used to for software design or other types of projects. We just kind of went for it. So it was very experimental, very evolutionary. 
untried, lots of unknown realms of learning, kind of a parallel with the moon base itself. And we also wanted to learn about us. We knew we could, and it's been very successful so far, but we didn't want time constraints either. I mean, it's kind of a year project, but on the other hand, it may very well stretch into longer than a year. So, but we all kind of agreed that we wanted to design a realistic, simulated virtual world moon base. And like I mentioned, there's eight different uh, teams we divided into. And then our focus shift to, well, we've got to share our, what we've uh, come up with, with the uh, Science Circle participants to recruit members and such, uh, which was also successful, which we did earlier. And I'm updating what we've done now, about six months later. Okay, so let's take a look at the project teams. And that's where uh, we'll have some participation by the team leaders. So science and education, since we were into science and education, <laughs> primarily are obviously part of what we want to do with the moon base project. Let's take a look a little bit at that. Uh, Syzygy, who's here, um, raise your hand, Syzygy. <laughs> okay, everybody knows. Okay, is a head of the science group. And it's the, it was the first large subgroup, and we actually had a separate space for that. And raise his hand. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and if I, okay, so we can, he kind of uh, decided, okay, we want to look at three different parts, namely getting to the moon, landing there, and then living on the moon. No one's done the third, the living on the moon. We've had a few people try to land on the moon, but you can see how hard that is. There's only been uh, four nations now that have done it. Uh, land, soft landing, and then getting to the moon which has changed a great deal. And then uh, the idea with the science group was to then study the science of the moon and its place in the solar system and the sciences involved with designing and building a sustainable habitat. And then also the science involving people living and working together in small spaces in hazardous environments for months. Okay, so with the science team, our current approach is kind of to um, look at real world entities too and the thinking and planning there to use them as a model. And I just mentioned the three phases and then we also wanted to understand, well, why do we go there? <laughs> and our evolving view of the earth and moon. In other words, none of this, it doesn't matter technology, none of this would have been possible say 200 years ago because they had no idea really what the moon was or that we could even get there. Okay, so, you know, uh, basically this is some of the first technology for getting there uh, and thinking about how do we get there um, when we're able to build rockets and, and learn of how to maneuver things in space and to even get to the moon in the first place. A lot of the first missions, if you look back, uh, were not successful in getting to the moon. The very first mission that tried missed the moon by about a thousand, uh, a thousand kilometers at least. Okay, and then lately we've also been looking at, well, how do we get there with the least energy because that means the least weight. And so people have been looking at, uh, this is kind of a very detailed diagram, but it basically says, okay, how much rocket burns, if you want to call it, uh, the delta V, the change in velocity would it take to get into orbit? into the geosynchronous orbit, to Lagrange points, to moon orbit, to landing on the moon, to going to Mars, and all that. So in other words, people are thinking a lot more sophisticated than just punching a rocket and getting to the moon. Then in the education part, um, I'm leading that section. And I gave a presentation back in Mars, March, Mars, <laughs> back in Freudian cycle. Okay, as to what, what can we learn by going back to the moon? So some of the slides you'll see on here have kind of come partly from that. But we wanted to know at the, at the very beginning what we thought about the moon to begin with. Because back in the early days, it was thought of as a realm of the gods and there's no way you could actually get to it. Um, and then later on in the 1800s, uh, this, these are all from educational briefs that we've... <laughs> Yeah, going back to Mars. 
well, I don't know. I, I really like to try to be the, the Martian person today, except as long as he had a good ending. One time I actually thought about, well, you know, if there's a 50% 50 50 chance of being of arriving on the moon and being able to live there for a year, I'd do it, you know? Okay. Um, any case, then uh, people started learning about what's here between here and the moon. These are from educational briefs that we've done this year with the group. And then um, we talked about, well, how do you land on the moon? And like I said, this is not trivial because there haven't been that many soft landing or how many or have many nations that have done soft landings. And so we're looking at some of the math. These are all here again from educational groups. Okay, so then the next group of the eight teams that we have had to do with construction and scripting. And so uh, Terry, for example, who's our architect, gave a presentation in April on the difference between living on the moon and living on Earth, which is quite substantial when you get into it. And then uh, this, uh, at the end of spring and then in the summer, I built a little site for us to, so people would start understanding what our project was about. It had eight different um, areas to match the teams. And then the moon with its, um, with all of the different places that, uh, to, uh, that have gone to the moon, all the missions you'll see there is right there in the center of the island. That's back from the observed the uh, moon night long ago. And then I decided I'd build um, uh, well, yeah, work in progress. <laughs> okay, so um, and and I'll actually talk about that here in a second. But then I decided, well, you know, most people the a moon base is so far out under construction, exactly, uh, is so far out of our realm of what it would be. I mean, you know, um, that I decided to build three up on Stem Island. I decided to build three areas. One is a, a couple uh, houses of, of, based on floor plans. So that, uh, and then I've got to put some uh, signs in there, but basically they're like, okay, here is the bathroom, here's the kitchen, here's the living room. Do we need these in a moon base? And if so, how are we going to do that on, on a moon base? How are you going to have entryways that are, you know, from vacuum into a um, house? How are we going to heat it? You know, everything. And then, you know, we've done some of this in the International Space Station. So how do people live in the International Space Station? So I'm building a full-scale replica of what's called the gateway space station which is going to be built around the moon and then finally some ideas about what the moon base might look like so here's a couple of what i've done so far you can see uh without the roof on it you can see one of the houses like on earth and then uh, a start of the build of these are full scale a start of the build of the gateway space station and so that's kind of where we're at as far as construction. Now, in scripting, the scripting people along with the science uh, people were the first team to actually start doing some things. And so we've got uh, people from the scripting team here today. And so let's see, do we have, I'm looking on my list here. <laughs> I know we've got Roy, is Robert here? Well, of course, scripting, as you say, is sort of a uh, uh, the thing that follows construction, uh, so that we can add uh, dynamic features and uh, other things to the constructions. Uh, I happen to be a old school programmer. I mean, I wrote my first program in uh, September of 1969, Fortran, um, but. Uh, uh, you know, coming forward in this and to uh, using uh, the Linden scripting language and so forth, uh, we've been doing a lot of exploratory work. And actually, there's a, a number of people that have uh, come up and said, well, they'd like to learn scripting. 
So we're, uh, uh, you know, kind of making provision for that as well. Uh, things we've done so far, uh, we've set up a little prototype area uh, where we've built a, a workable lunar rover that you can ride around, uh, programmed airlocks, uh, a uh, prototype starship with elevator and uh, uh, similar things. And uh, I'm also uh, working on the idea of having a, uh, a docent type character that uh, would provide information to people at uh, various exhibits uh, for the moon project. Uh, so we're looking at doing that. And there are some uh, games and stuff that we can also set up. I believe Roy Certain Sutton has set up the uh, uh, Lunar Lander game. And I think he was going to put some notes about that into chat. Is, is Roy here? Um, yeah, he's here. Um, but uh, I think he said he was going to mention that. And you can go to the prototype area and actually try it out. Uh, it's basically a game where you must uh, carefully ration out your uh, Delta V to softly land on the surface without running out of it first, because if you come down too fast, you crash. And if you run out of your Delta V, uh, you will crash also. So it's it's basically learning how to uh, moderate your uh, fuel usage. So all of that's ongoing. If you go to the prototype area, you'll see a, uh, a, a dome structure in the rover and uh, a starship and uh, a few other items, a lander. And everyone's welcome to go there. I don't think I brought a landmark with me, but uh, it is available. Uh, you know, for people who wish to visit. It's it's on mainland, so it's open to everybody. You just uh, uh, go into uh, Second Life's mainland, which a lot of people are surprised uh, to even know exists, but it's there. And um, yeah, you can have a look. Um, and I think it's about all I really have to say about the uh, scripting side right now. Uh, if anyone would like to... Uh, throw up some questions. I'm looking over here at the chat to see if anything's coming in. Okay, I, I don't see anything coming in. So, oh wait, um, someone asked for a demo. I don't know, Roy, is this a working demo next to me? Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna do that right at the end because I don't know how long people are gonna be here. All righty. So in that case, I guess I shall turn the presentation back over to you. Okay, perfect. And yeah, you can crash it. <laughs> That's the whole value of second life uh, simulations. <laughs> okay. Uh, continuing on here. Okay, so the uh, next group of teams we have is psychology and ethics. And what we've done in that is uh, the first thing that we looked at was well, why are we engaged in this project? In other words, it was a psychology of ethics. And essentially, why one of the reasons um, why we want to do this is because we want to explore how a diverse group on Earth, in other words, us, uh, can work together in a challenging project full of unknowns before considering working in a life threatening environment. Okay? So, in other words, we're actually studying ourselves. And, uh, Debbie Junkowitz uh, led a couple of important studies. Um, starting back in January about why project members were engaged in this. Why we're engaged in what we wanted to accomplish, and then how the different focuses of the exploration were related to uh, from our own perspective. Okay, and then the human element really is, in other words, we can figure out how to land on the moon, how to do all that stuff, and how to get to places, and what a moon base should look like, and how to protect us. But really, the human element is the most unknown factors. So if you'll recall or read about, essentially the first humans on the moon were all male military pilots who had been trained over many, many years as far as discipline and working together in teams and all of that. And then they were only there for a few days. Uh, so how will, well, that too, 
but then how will mixed gender civilians with diverse backgrounds work in close quarters for months under hazardous conditions? And so uh, the ethics part of it and the psychology part of it is really part of every discussion we've had. And the overriding questions we basically have had is, how do we go to the moon? You know, in other words, the footprints from the astronauts will be there possibly after humans are extinct. We're talking a million years or so. Or long after we're, perhaps we've evolved into something else. But so how do we live there without destroying the environment? Do we want open pit mines? Do we want flashing signs that say, you know, eat at Joe's or whatever? Um, well, we could also destroy ourselves. In other words, the human poop on the moon and the, and the footprints may be the only thing that archaeologists have of our civilization. But I want to be positive. <laughs> so we also need to think about the rules of behavior uh, and agree to them, because it's international. It's not just a, a nations. It's like Antarctica. Uh, how do we agree to how we're going to operate up there? Okay, and there, and then the next two or the uh, other part of the eight. Oh, you did. Well, it could be there for a while too. Um, so the next part of the eight there, and I see Natalie getting up because that's part of her, her cue here, is outreach and writing. And we have had a, a lot of outreach. <laughs> we have a. We've kept. Uh, we. In other words, from an outreach standpoint, we've kept the science circle informed and re reached out to other. We had field trips. We presented to the different groups. We've uh, presented to the Virtual World Education Consortium. We've had a, a and then a presentation in um, the Science Circle East. Um, in fact, actually, we've had eight presentations so far on this this year. You may just not have uh, be familiar with it. So. What is the value of good writing or good presentation? We all know about you know Carl Sagan and Isaac Asimov and lots of other people who have either Neil deGrasse Tyson and others who have written uh, or spoken about science and education stuff. So Natalie came up with a marvelous idea about reading from a book that she found, and so I'm going to give it over to her to explain what. I'm talking about. Um, I can't Excuse hear. Me, she I got it. Never mind. I got it. I got it. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Phil. Um, and I also want well, to that say that. That's <laughs> Yeah, at any rate, yeah, I'm talking now. Uh, uh, I first of all, I want to thank uh, Shira for bringing in and and Roy for bringing in the space lander in the tunnel because this is a real uh, physical illustration of the sort of things we can do in Second Life. What I want to chat with you a little bit about today, though, is a book by Kim Stanley Robinson called Red Moon, that is fundamentally a murder mystery, and in typical Kim Stanley Robinson fashion, it's full of of physics and social advocacy and philosophy and politics. And he goes into a lot of scientific stuff about how the moon is formed and people who go there end up sleeping in this centrifuge device because it's better to sleep in 1G. And, and he talks about making soil from lunar regolith and lava tubes and the architecture of buried buildings. But the piece I want to read you today is um, a chapter that's done in the voice of one of the main characters called Ta Shu who's a poet, a feng shui expert, and the guy has a travel show. And this is a kind of fascinating character that, that uh, Robinson sometimes comes up with. The, the deal is this guy is now on the moon, and he's, he's uh, uh, sending his travel show back to Earth to give people a feel for what it's like to be on the moon. And the reason I picked this section out is because um, we have the, op the, op sure, the opportunity here in Second Life to do a realistic simulation. And this doesn't have to all be done by scientists. So what I really want to encourage is the, the non-scientist folks in the, in the group 
today or in the audience to get involved in this because we need we need artists we need people who can conceive of how to to uh, show things that that maybe we've never really seen before and make them realistic for folks in in Second Life and and a lot of these other a lot of these uh, the, the the book in uh, Robinson's books really treats the moon as a character in the drama. And I think he really portrays the, the just the magnificence of the moon in a way that uh, I had never really heard before. So I think, and you know, Robinson is a reliable narrator. So I want to take a couple minutes and, and read to you Tashu's Ta um, description of the first time he's actually out on the moon walking. And keep in mind that I, I'm doing this because I'd, I'd really like to um, build some enthusiasm for really building a realistic landscape that um, um, depicts what it's like. So, so listen to this. Robinson writes, again, in the voice of this travel log guy. <clears throat> Tashu says, now I've left one of these new settlements, the Petroff Crater Station, to stand outside on the surface of the moon. To do so, I have donned a spacesuit, and I exited the shelter through airlocks, and I'm now walking on the surface of the moon. This is the first time I've ever walked by myself on the moon. It feels very strange, I can assure you. Outside, it's daytime. I was told it is the lunar morning, about halfway between dawn and midday. Shadows are black, but not pitch black. Reflection of sunlight from other lit surfaces tints the shadows to varying degrees, giving me an extra sense of the shapes of hills derived from the shades of black and gray in the shadows. Where the land is in sunlight, it is very bright. We're at about 20 degrees latitude here, so the sun is fairly high in the sky. My faceplate is tinted and keeps the sunlight from damaging my eyes. I don't know what it would look like if the tint wasn't there. Although it's adjustable, I was told, so let's dial it down and see. Oh my, oh yes, the tinting was much darker than I thought. No doubt also polarized and so on. Right now I can't see a thing. I'm blinded. With the tint taken away, the world is simply bursting with white light. I can't even see the shadows, and it's as if the sun were a god and has struck me with a bolt of lightning for my presumption in daring to look at it as it really is. Wow. I've got the tinting back up now, but it will take a while for my pupils to dilate. I'm sure they were close to close up completely. I wonder if that's possible. The Kiyakasuro effect, as I regain my vision, is extreme. No subtleties of gray now, just a very harsh white and an absence of white that is grainy black. No stars visible to me now. The sky is even blacker than any shadow on land. A wrenching field of contrasts, simply white and black, the black of those particular bird feathers that capture all the light that strikes them. It looks to me now as if I've grown mad or I'm suffering a seizure. But let's agree to call this an exposure to reality. The sublime in a certain strain of Western aesthetics is said to be a fusion of beauty and terror. In China, the seven feelings don't mention this combination, but now I think I know what it is. It's a true feeling, the sublime. It's spirit confronted by sheer matter, as Hegel put it. Under my feet, the ground is white, touched here and there by shadows of rocks. My vision is coming back. The rocks lie on a blanket of white dust that looks somehow like snow or loose. The rocks are isolatos, and their appearance is random. They have not been disturbed by any stream or glacier or wave, not by water action of any kind. This is immediately obvious when you look around. The rocks don't look right. Nothing has sorted them, and their sizes are also random, small, large, in between. They look like they've dropped here out of the sky, and they have. Many are the size of pots or baskets, and almost all of them look like roughly rounded cubes without any of the sharp facets you see in the Earth's mountains, where so many rocks have recently broken. These rocks are not weathered or weather-beaten. They are sun-beaten. Billions of years of photon rain, unfiltered by clouds or even air, have slowly knocked the edges off these rocks. That withering weathering of photonic rain looks different from any other kind of weathering, as for instance by water rain. And I recall the ventifacts of Antarctica's dry valleys, 
rocks shaped by the abrasion of wind-blown sand. These, by analogy, could be called solar facts. There are a lot of them. It's necessary to step around them. The old movies of the Apollo astronauts don't reveal this that often, but those astronauts were just like me. They had to avoid walking into the rocks or treading on rocks underfoot. Another way I'm like the Apollo people and everyone else walking on the moon is that I have to adjust my gait to the gravity. In this, it's the same out here as indoors, except out here one has to wear a spacesuit, so it really isn't the same. I weigh only about 10 kilos on the moon, and my spacesuit and its air supply weigh about the same. What that means is that about half of my perceived weight is right there in my skin. I'm feeling a bit hollow, in other words, as well as very light altogether. I jump, oh my, look out, oh my, fall to my knees, as you may have deduced from my visuals. It is very easy to push myself back up. Oh wait, not so easy. Not so easy to keep my balance. Must restore balance. Just a second here. Kind of a dance step. Might as well dance. Hopping or skipping with one foot always kept in front, leading the way. Beautiful. Spinning slowly around, trusting I can recover my balance if I lose it, or just get back up. I see the hills look odd, too. Not tectonic action, nor rain, nor riverbeds, nor glaciers, nor wind shaped these hills. They are uncanny. You can see something is different here, and it's hard not to feel it's wrong. The uncanny is always wrong, always frightening. In the hills, they were made by meteors impacting the moon at cosmic speed, coming in faster than we landed here in our very fast spaceship. Boom. Incredible. Impact. Huge masses of rock vaporized to melted slag and thrown up and outward to fall in circles or ovals around the impact site. Mostly circles. Apparently you have to hit it quite a glancing angle before an oval gets made. In any case, impact after impact, circle after circle, until eventually the circles lay on top of one another in a palm set layers deep. The, layer, the later impacts therefore landed not on the hard basalt of old lava basins, but on earlier circles and their circumferences of rubble. Slowly but surely, this made the land lumpy. Actually, given all that, it should look even more torn up than it does. But all of that happened long ago, and since then, the sun has been breaking the rocks apart into this infinite blanket of dust. When I jump on this dust, I don't sink in far. I think it is compressed under the pull of the moon's gravity until it's pretty well packed. This was a question they didn't really have an answer for when they first landed on the moon. Those Apollo landers could have sunk right in and disappeared into soft dust, like a rock into quicksand, but they didn't. The scientists figured it, figured it would be this way and decided to test it and see, trusting their analysis. And the astronauts trusted the scientists. This is an alien shore. This is not a human place. I must trust my spacesuit not to fail. And I must remember, if I can, that we are always in a spacesuit of one sort or another. We just don't usually see it. Walking around now, wow, I can't believe what I just saw. I feel like jumping, and I bet I can jump high. Let's try that. Wow, I try a little higher and come down and jump again and again. Now I'm a rabbit, maybe even a kangaroo. <laughs> oh, my sorry. I will try to compose myself, but <laughs> oh my, not so easy jumping. The moon is funny, and it's scary, too. Yes, terrifying. Actually, it shouldn't be this funny, but it is. I can't stop jumping. And why should I? Excuse me while I fly. At the highest point of my jumps, I see the horizon shifts a bit. It is so near and so irregular that I can catch glimpses over the horizon just by jumping into the sky. The white top of a hill pops into sight over a nearby shaded hollow, Disappears again, reappears, disappears. Oh, it's all so strange. It feels so strange. Okay, those are the words from our Feng Shui, Shui master about what it's like to be on the moon. And again, I just find that very uh, exciting and very stimulating and very encouraging. And I hope we can all work together to produce some sense of feeling like that on this moose base we're building. Um, uh, I, I think it's an extraordinary opportunity we have, as, as Phil says, to make a realistic but simulated version of this. Um, you don't have to be a scientist to participate. 
And I, I encourage you to think about these things and um, think about ways we can all be involved to create that sort of an environment that's funny, that's strange, that's terrifying, and that, that gives us some sense of the bizarre nature of the moonscape. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent. And as Natalie pointed out, all you have to do is be a writer with imagination uh, and try to describe things. And then, you know, scientists, other people can say, is that plausible or real or whatever? But you might come up with some ideas that no one thought about or that force people to think about. Now, in order to have enough time to go play with the lunar lander and stuff like that, what I'm going to do is there's a few more slides. I'm going to uh, go a couple slides and then jump down toward the end because there's something I want to say. And then if we have any time at all, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the current moon missions and stuff, but let's, but I'll uh, skip a bit of the stuff uh, in between. Okay, so the, the next thing I'd like to point out here and uh, is kind of our future involvement. We both agreed at least on two things. One is we want to make this educational. So in other words, we want to complete the builds uh, so that both self-guided and guided education, we want to explore how ethical and sustainable living can be conducted there. And yeah, we all need to dance. <laughs> I'd love to see some of the social events and uh, sports and stuff that take a place on the moon. And then we want to make some model solutions for a near future moon base. Those are the pri and then, uh, uh, primary uh, things we want to explore. Now, rather than go into lunar missions past and present, let me see if I can jump to the slide slides at the bottom here of my presentation. I've got 70 slides. Let me see. Hey, I got it. Number 67. Okay, so how our organization can play a part, how you could play a part in the organization. So let's take a look at that. For one, we felt that we could play a part uh, in real moon exploration, lunar exploration by continuing to talk about science education and outreach. In other words, provide interested persons uh, in Second Life and beyond uh, with accurate science education about various aspects of exploration and ethical habitation. Um, but also, we may be able to provide some new perspectives, much like, hey, I like the um, dancing astronaut over there. OK, and so also new perspectives. In other words, we're such a unique group full of different people that we may be able to come up with ideas that are not thought of by more homogeneous uh, groups. And I, I'm talking about, you know, the, all the space agencies and such like that. OK, the other thing is, how could you contribute? Well, one is the science education outreach. In other words, you're, you're still invited to join us. We're, we're not an exclusive club. And so if you want to, if you think this is interesting and you want to join us, right now we're meeting on Mondays at um, 10 a.m., but we could also get you included in email and other ways of, uh, yeah, sign up. Oh, yeah, there is a sign up in back by the landing area. And, or you can be a spokesman for the Science Circle and the Moon Base group with whatever groups you belong. In other words, if they go talking about the latest missions to the moon or they'd like to be up there, you could always go, oh, by the way, have you heard? Okay. And then, of course, share your thoughts about what it might be like to live on the moon and others. And you don't have to be a scientist at all to think about that. You know, what would breakfast be like on the moon? What does breakfast even mean? What's a day on the moon look like? That kind of stuff. How long would you sleep? Okay, so that's kind of where we were. And, uh, and rather than talk about uh, missions in the past, we can probably get into that uh, later, is I'm going to kind of cut it off here for both questions and then also so, you, so people who are at work or can only spend an hour uh, can play with the lunar lander. Okay, back to the future. <laughs> okay, uh, any, any questions? Otherwise, you're welcome to come up and uh, play with the lander or with the uh, tunnel. Hey, why don't you tell, tell me about the tunnel real quick and so people know what that is. Or you could just experience it. But come on up.
In other words, this is this. I'm going to cut it off early uh, so you guys can play with stuff. Okay, that was a pretty good crash. <laughs> Okay, now if you want to see where this really goes, click on uh, the lunar lander or something. You can actually see it up in the in the sky, just like you could see a person flying or anything else. Wow! Who did that one? Nice job. But we, we need to get you to be an astronaut or a pilot or something if that was your first job. I crashed it lots of times before I was successful. Okay, since we have some minutes, um, I think we'll kill two birds with one stone, which I've never liked that um, saying because we, I like birds, but <clears throat> I'll show you some slides. I just won't narrate them much uh, while you come down and play with the lunar lander. Yeah, try it. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna show some slides where everybody's playing around since we've got a few minutes here. Here's a slide you can read. It's about why are we going to the moon? Someone asked that earlier. Now bear in mind with this lunar lander that you simply have one vector to solve. <laughs> in other words, you, uh, coming in from orbit, you'd be looking at x, y, and z, not just z. <clears throat> yeah, vexatious <laughs> vector, I love it. 
Okay, so bottom, bottom line with going to the moon is, first of all, it's car, kind of hard to squash curiosity. Uh, it's also a gateway to the other world. And unfortunately, it is kind of a space race 2.0. Um, in one of the NASA briefs recently, they called it Space Race 2.0, more or less, because, um, well, as competitive as people are, uh, they don't want to be to have someone else up there with a moon base and having done nothing themselves if they know that it's possible. Yeah, go ahead, Brianne. Yeah, for you guys that were programmers, uh, oh, a teletype version. Okay, for you guys that were programmers, um, Unix and some of the early operating systems were built to make games. <laughs> you know, young people design programmers, programming. Okay, so really quickly, we've got a few minutes, is that uh, the space lunar missions can be uh, broken down into several phases. One really was a space race between primarily uh, two national entities. And then people decided kind of to um, work closer to home, in other words, Earth orbit. And a lot more nations got involved in that. And then Moon 2.0 is not just two nations. It's lots of nations and, and also companies like uh, some of the ones that are that you see up there. So the idea is uh, several focuses. One is kind of what's called cis-lunar operations. In other words, transitioning from lunar orbit to more or less moon orbit and everything in between. And being able to tr transfer technology and what they've learned with the International Space Station, which has been around for uh, as long as some young people's lives, and partnerships and working out treaties and such internationally. The second focus is national missions. You may not realize it because they don't always make the papers, but there were 15 missions to the moon last year alone. Well, for one, water, I just to answer the thing in that, water will immediately, because of no pressure, water will immediately evaporate. In other words, uh, sublime, not even a, uh, so when you're talking about water under pressure, it will because of one sense of gravity, for example, would be kind of different. Uh, now, India's was the fourth nation to land on the moon, soft land. Yeah, in a pressurize. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I'm I'm yeah, I'm talking and trying to chew gum at the same time. Okay, so Russia tried to do a soft landing but was unsuccessful. Um, Japan already launched a lunar, and if and if they succeed in uh, some months coming up, they'll be the fifth nation to softly land on the moon. But they're trying a precision landing. In other words. Everybody else, it was kind of like, well, we got within a few kilometers. <laughs> okay. But uh, Japan is trying to land in a very precise thing, as if they're landing, say, at a moon base. And then, of course, there's the Artemis group, which is not one nation. But they actually did a, a crude landing for the first time since 1972, go around the moon, and they're well, excuse me, are scheduling to do that in 2024. But they've already, uh, Artemis 1 was non-crude, um, but they did make it safely around the moon. 
And this is the Gateway Station that I mentioned. And some of the details, this is what I'm going to try to build of on a STEM island. And then the third focus is individual missions, in other words, by universities or na other nations or such, because these don't cost very much uh, compared to, and they're only like 10 centimeters or less, very tiny little spacecraft that go aboard other spacecraft. And then the fourth uh, focus is the moon bases. And lots of reasons why. And right now, it's primarily between uh, China and the US, uh, whether who will have the first moon base. And the author of the book that Natalie read from um, envisioned a Chinese moon base. OK, but not like this. This is later. Uh, we were talking about last week, actually, about probably being just an inflatable pod or something is the first place to get in out of the weather, so to speak, and be able to pressurize it. So mentioning uh, China, and I'll be done in just about a minute, um, mentioning China is that China has been continuously for five missions now landing things on the moon starting in 2007 and also creating a communications relay this, this next year coming up and then also collecting samples at the South Pole and continuing on to a manned mission. But they've been very uh, successful about that. And then, of course, the Artemis missions, as I mentioned. Okay, so that's actually uh, the end of the presentation. And Chantel wants me to mention the observe the moon night. And here's the I'm looking at it now. But NASA actually has another. What we did was this is kind of how we got started last year, in around the same time. And there's observe the moon night, and we'd like to put. Uh, there's lots and lots of little dots. <laughs> there's a thousand events now. And we'd like to put a little dot for the uh, science circle if you're at all interested, even if it's a private event or online or whatever. Now, last time, over where the moon is in the middle of this island, we had an event where uh, Cass, who has her own uh, um, observatory in Switzerland, actually did a live stream from Switzerland, if you remember and a lot of other types of things that we did that, that lasted an entire day. Um, so we kind of really did it up. And even if we have minor events this time or stuff, I'd like to be able to put a, yeah, it was, and uh, a uh, science circle dot on the map with a, here's, here's again the uh, URL. And it'd be nice to put sign circle on there again so that people around the world could see what we're doing. Okay, so that, that's our presentation for today. Bottom line, we're still working. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you're welcome to join us. We're going to continue to uh, do, come down and try the lander if you have time. And remember, we'll be getting to you about the Observe the Moonlight. So it's, it's almost a full circle, so to speak. And thanks, thanks again to uh, Robert and Roy and Natalie for helping to us to envision more about what we're doing.